sunshine or a thunder, the captain pilots me, the captain pilots me. Treasure, treasure, this chest is full of treasure, with lessons fine as gold, of love that has no Stories never old, the stories never old. My captain's name is Jesus, the treasure chest God's word, like softly flowing breezes. Come the lessons from his word, come the lessons from his word. My name's Joey Robito. I didn't really paint this picture. I was just playing. What can I do for you? Oh, you want to know about the history of the Sabbath? You're going to have to ask my dad about that. He's in the library. Let's go see him. My dad has a big library, and he can answer all the questions you have. Oh, hi. What can I do for you? This little girl wants to know about the history of the Sabbath. Well, come on in. I'll answer your questions for you. This is one of my favorite little books. It's called The Sabbath of God Through the Centuries by Elder Coldheart. And you know, that book tells about the Sabbath kept in every century. You can hold that. That's nice. This book here was written in the 19th century by a man named J.N. Andrews, and it tells about the Sabbath kept all the way through the time of the Great Reformation. And that book shows that there were Sabbath keepers all over Europe. In fact, this book shows that that book is true. It's called The Sabbath in Scripture and History, and it shows that some Sabbath keepers are still keeping the Sabbath today after 2,000 years, the Ethiopians and the Armenians. This book called Facts of Faith tells the same story. It came out in the 1940s. This one's my favorite. It's called Truth Triumphant, and it tells about the Sabbath kept all over the world, even through China and Japan. B.G. Wilkinson traveled all over the world gathering quotations. This book here by Brian Ball tells us that the pilgrims or the Puritans of England, many of them kept the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Many people don't know that, I know. And the Sabbath and Sunday in early Christianity by Mr. Odom tells the same story. The Sabbath was kept all over the world for the first five centuries. There are some books that aren't written by Christians that tell the same story, like this book from Bangor, Ireland. And we got this in Ireland. See, isn't that a pretty picture? And it says that those Irishmen kept the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. This book here tells about the old Silk Road of, of China and Turkestan. And it shows that the old Sabbath-keeping Christians kept the Sabbath throughout China and even were responsible for bringing knowledge to those parts of the world. I have a lot more books, but I don't really know just what you want. Will these books help you? No. They're nice books, but I can't read very good, and I need books with lots of pictures. Oh, I have some slides and some movies. I have some books that have pictures in them, and I can paint you some pictures, too, while I tell you the story. Do you think that that'll help you to understand it better? Yeah, that sounds real good. You know what we're going to have to do? Yeah. We're going to have to take our story right to the very beginning. Way back when God created the world. The Garden of Eden. Now, Adel, just imagine waking up in the morning in the midst of a beautiful, tropical garden with the mist rising from the floor of the oh, forest. How pretty. And all around you, you can hear water dripping. You hear a bubbling stream right nearby. You smell the fragrance of wonderful flowers. Every kind of color and size and smell is all around you. Your eyes are filled with the beauty of so many kinds of plants. In the shadows, you oh, see meat, and there's a beautiful white egret. In fact, the whole forest is alive with animals. They're everywhere. They're friendly. Otters. There's animals in the water. Oh, look. Like a great big yeah, hippo. hippo. And an elephant washing himself and saying hello. There are animals in the forest, munching on the grass and munching on the trees. Giraffes. 
you hear the sound of a big tiger. tiger. And a lion says, hello, hello. A gorilla strolls towards you with a smile on his face, and the chimp just smiles at you too. Doesn't it just thrill your heart to think that the Creator loved you so much He made all these things just for you? That's how Adam and Eve felt on the sixth day of creation. Then Jesus spent the whole seventh day with them. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Once He's done that, whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. Good, a picture. Let's just imagine in this picture, Adam and Eve, on the very first Sabbath day, as they meet their Creator. They're surrounded by the beautiful green of the forest, drooping leaves and mist and animals all around them. A and a great big yes. lion for a pet. Wouldn't that be wonderful to just have a great big lion to put your arms around? I'd hug him. And let's also try to imagine Jesus coming and being their first teacher, telling them all about the world that they live in. He's kind of their father and teacher in a way because he made them. He never wanted Adam and Eve to forget him. And so I he gave them forget. something very special. He created a whole day just to spend with him every single week. He said, don't forget, this is a special sign between you and I that I am your creator. In fact, in the word Sabbath is the word sign of our Father. The word has three parts. Sab, which means our learned Father. B, which means house of an oath sign, the dwelling place of the Father's sign. The next thing is to imagine that you're on a beach and you can see the waves crashing at your feet. And you can hear the sound of the roaring ocean. Feel the sand beneath your feet. Do you know that that ocean is what's left of the flood of Noah? Can you imagine how lonely that little family must have felt? Only eight people and nobody else in the whole world. Noah and his family had the same religion as Adam and Eve, and Methuselah, and Enoch. Paint me another picture. Okay, I'll paint you a picture of Noah's Ark. Let's have a blue sky. Everything must have been green because there was so much water everywhere. Don't you think the animals were happy to run from the ark and roll in the grass? Yeah. I think Noah was happy, too, to get out of that ark. That's a big ark. The ark mustn't have smelled very good. Although they stayed in it for a while, I think that they probably looked around for something else to live in as soon as possible. There weren't many big trees, so they couldn't build a nice house. You know what I think? I think that they found a nice, great, big, cozy cave to stay in, someplace warm to come to in the evening when they were done each day with their work, in the garden and with their animals. How do you know that? <laughs> oh, you're rubbing paint on your lip. Now, on the seventh day, they wouldn't want to stay in that old cave. They would want a nice little church. I think they made a nice tent, a beautiful tent, that they dressed up in nice, clean, special clothing just for the Sabbath day to meet with God, and that they went there to pray and spend all day with their Creator. Remember, their religion was the same as that of Adam and Eve. You don't know they really had a tent, do you? Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, yuck, you rub paint on your nose. You look like a clown. Hmm? Huh? Noah and his family kept the Sabbath, and we know that for sure. The whole story is explained in the old Chinese words. You see, the old Chinese writing is made up of little pictures, and each picture tells us a story. A story? When we look at early Chinese writing, we can see pictures of Noah and the flood and the precious Sabbath day. Really? 
Let's look at just four Chinese words to give you an example. You see this first symbol? That is a little picture of a box with something inside. It means an ark. The Chinese word chao. Now let's put another symbol. This is the pa. It means eight. And if we unite that with the kao, or a person's mouth, it means eight mouths in the ark or eight people in the ark. These three pictures together is the Chinese word for chuan, which Chihuan. means boat. Noah's boat. Now, if we take the old Chinese symbol for eight, which is the eight people in the ha, ark, and we put that together with the kao in abbreviated form, we have the word kung, which means grandfather. Grandpa Noah. These words have to come from the time of Noah and the ark. Now this is an old Chinese symbol for a tent. Doesn't look like If a we unite that with the seventh day or qi, the Sabbath, and then unite those two symbols with the old Chinese word for being in clean dress or civil, we have the so Chinese word qian, which reads godliness. Now there you can see why I believe that Noah and his family worshipped in a tent on the seventh day in clean clothes. You're right. <laughs> now I'll show you one last example. Let's draw our picture of the tent again and again unite it with the symbol of the seventh day or the chi. Looks like a little T, doesn't it? Kind of. Underneath the seventh, we'll put a little picture of two people standing on the ground praying or worshiping with uplifted hands. Altogether, it is the Chinese word humble, su. Now, let's imagine ourselves up on Mount Sinai with Moses. Okay. We're surrounded by dark clouds. We see the flash of lightning, lightning. the roll of thunder in the Ooh. background. We can see the Creator writing with His own finger on solid rock, the that Ten Commandment hard. Law. Remember, whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. That Ten Commandments was written on rock with the finger of God as a sign that it should never, ever be forgotten, that it was eternal. I Moses had a special work of bringing that Ten Commandment Law to the people and putting it in their sanctuary and reading it every Sabbath so that they would not forget it. The fourth commandment says to remember the seventh day Sabbath to keep it holy. You see, it was the same creator that gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Jesus. As the ancient kings of the East used little carved stones to press their special sign into clay, the Creator put his special sign of remembrance, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, into his law. God says, it is a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you or make your heart clean and pure and kind. Because we are sanctified through the body of Jesus, the seventh day Sabbath is the special sign of Jesus. Oh. For a perpetual covenant, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever and ever. Now, when this cylinder seal, like God's law, is pushed into soft clay, like our hearts, it makes a picture or a sign. And just so, when God forgives our sins and puts his law into our hearts, his special Seventh-day Sabbath will be seen by everyone as a special sign that we belong to Jesus, the real creator. I want to belong to A Jesus. thousand years later, God's people were forgetting him and That's his Sabbath. sad. And so God used the cruel Assyrians and the powerful and wicked Babylonians to punish and conquer them. Millions were made slaves and prisoners. Oh. These prisoners were scattered among the many nations of the East. And in this way, the nations of the world were able to learn about God's holy law and the seventh day Sabbath. That's good. Among those prisoners that remained faithful to God was Daniel. Daniel was made prime minister of Babylon and later Persia. 
because he was so well loved and renowned, the knowledge of his religion and his teachings became famous throughout the whole world, even as far away as China. As China? We understand that the Chinese people began to keep the Hebrew Sabbath. Confucius wrote about 500 years before the time of Jesus. The ancient kings on this culminating day closed their gates, the merchants did not travel, and the princes did not inspect their domains. Confucius's writing were the most important writings in China at that time. Ooh, Probably the whole <laughs> world observed the Sabbath in one form or another in those old days. Many, many years world? later, before the time of Christ, the Jews were well established throughout the whole world. At the University of Alexandria, Egypt, a Jewish teacher named Philo declared the seventh day to be a festival not of this or that city, but of the universe. <laughs> this man with the funny <laughs> turbaned hat is the old Jewish historian Josephus. During the days of the first Christian missionaries, he wrote, there is not a city of the Grecians, nor any of the barbarians, nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day hath not come. This Jewish school teacher is showing the children oh, a model of Jerusalem in like Jerusalem today. House. Can't you just imagine it filled with crowds of people? And among those people, just imagine Jesus and his disciples walking and talking and teaching. In the temple courts, Jesus taught the people about the kingdom of heaven. One of the things that he explained to the people was about the Sabbath. He told the people that he, the Son of Man, was the Lord of the Sabbath and that he had made the Sabbath day for man. Well, yes, but they need to be quiet while we show the pictures. Okay, guys, you can come in. Where'd they all come from? first picture I have to show you is a picture of an ancient city not far from Jerusalem called Pila. This was the city where the Christian Jews fled when Jerusalem was destroyed. Eusebius, the famous historian, wrote, Then the spiritual seed of Abraham fled to Pila on the other side of Jordan, where they found a safe place of refuge and could serve their master and keep his Sabbath. So the early Christian Jews kept the seventh-day Sabbath. They met in the synagogue with the Jewish people. The disciples went to the Jews first all over the world, and they were already keeping the Sabbath. So we know that the early Christians kept the Sabbath. Not Sunday. They continued to populate the beautiful cities in a place called Decapolis, or the Ten Cities. These cities were very wealthy, oh. and the Christians had many wonderful churches there. There are pagan temples, too, but in this city called Jerash is a beautiful church called the Church of Theodorus. This is it the court of that church old. and the old laver that set out front of it. I found this symbol on one of the streets. It's a symbol of the Christians. You see the Alpha and the Omega and two flowers near the cross. Remember, Josephus wrote, There's not any city of the Grecians, nor the barbarians, nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day hath not come. That's everywhere. We also read from another historian, from the Apostles' time until a council of Laodicea, which was about the year 364, the holy observance of the Jews' Sabbath continued as may be proved out by many authors, yea, notwithstanding the decree of the council against it. The Christians later migrated up to northern Syria around a beautiful area called Antioch. This area had been the missionary outpost for Peter, Paul, and Barnabas. Today it's a beautiful city. There on a hillside overlooking the city is the old church 
that Peter first preached in there. Really? Antioch is where they were first called Christians. It was the first great missionary outpost. The Gentile Christians observed also the Sabbath. When we look at the beautiful cities in Greece, such as this city in Asia Minor called Ephesus, you have to realize that the church there and all the Greek Christians there kept the seventh day as the Sabbath. This is the ruins of Laodicea. Not a whole lot of it is left today, but we know that the Gentile Christians there, along with the Jews, kept the seventh day Sabbath. This is the ruins of old Corinth. Corinth, again, was a center of Christianity where the Seventh-day Sabbath was kept. For although almost all the churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper, on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, refuse to do this. Just the word Sabbath here can only refer to Saturday. It should be observed that Sunday is never called the Sabbath by the ancient fathers and historians. This is the old city of Edessa, now called Urfa in Turkey. In this city, the Christians once had a great university that sent physicians and missionaries out all over the world. Just south of Antioch was a civilization of 700 cities that belong to just the Christians. These cities are called the silent cities of Syria today. The homes are made of great big stones from 2 to 20 tons, put together that without any mortar. Hard These people were very wealthy from the business and trade of the old Silk Road that went all the way through China and into Rome. They must have been rich. Their tithe money went to build beautiful churches and support their ministry and missionaries that were as far away as Japan. Japan? Russia. Russia? China. China? India. India? All through Asia. All through Asia? Africa and the Middle East. And the Middle East? In the third East? century, one of the great teachers of Antioch, Lucian, gathered together the Hebrew Bible and the books of the New Testament in Greek and put together a beautiful Bible that is now called the Received Text. It was translated into Syrian, and that Bible is called the Peshitta and was read by all the people of the East. That Bible later became the King James Bible that we read today. I have one of them. These Syrians made the best buildings in the world. They were masters in what we call architecture. And their schools taught the young people to bring their knowledge of language and architecture everywhere. Where is that? In Constantinople, Looks like this. In the 6th century, Justinian wanted to build a great church. That church was called St. Sophia. He had to get architects from Syria that were Sabbath-keeping Christians to build this most beautiful church ever built. It took a thousand years before the people in the rest of the world were able to build a dome as big as that. The people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assembled together on the Sabbath as well as on the first day of the week, which custom is never observed at Rome or at Alexandria. See, still, 600 years after Christ, there was one center where they did not obey God's law. They should have kept the Sabbath. But in Persia, we read, the hills of Persia and the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates re-echoed their songs of praise. They reaped their harvests and paid their tithes. They repaired to their churches on the Sabbath day for the worship of God. God's people were still keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. Justinian made a terrible law that all in the Roman world had to convert to the false religion of Rome. That's terrible. Now, let's go along the old Silk Road through Asia. That's beautiful. To what we call Central Asia. Here is a beautiful city beneath the mountains of Asia called Bukhara. And this city here is called Samarkand. In these centers, were once Sabbath-keeping Christians that we call uh, Nestorians. A camel. These Nestorians brought the knowledge of language, they brought the knowledge of music and art and architecture to the people of Asia. Those Asians thought that they were very special people and almost worshipped these Nestorian Sabbath-keeping Christians. Look at some of the beautiful architecture that arose in the Muslim world as a result of the architectural teachings.
In China, there is found today old cities where buried treasures of manuscripts um, with portions of the Bible have been discovered. In one city, Kocho, this little mural was found on one of the walls. It shows a picture of an historian teaching Asian people, probably teaching them about God and about medicine and about architecture and about how to write their language. The historians eat no pork and keep the Sabbath. They believe in neither auricular confession nor purgatory. They were not connected with the Roman church. They could claim their ancestry way back to the time of the apostles, hundreds of years before. Like the disciples. Sabbath-keeping Christians had been in China for hundreds and hundreds of years. They were largely responsible for the greatest period of Chinese culture in the 7th and 8th centuries. In 781 AD, the famous Nestorian stone monument was erected by order of the emperor just outside of the grand capital city of Chang'an, China. In 1900 Chinese words, it describes the gospel and the grand missionary work of the Sabbath-keeping Christianity of the East. It also mentions the Sabbath. Listen. On the seventh day, we offer sacrifices after having purified our hearts and received absolution for our sins. This religion so perfect and so excellent is difficult to name, but it enlightens darkness by its brilliant precepts. Isn't that a wonderful description of the religion that Jesus gave to his people in the Garden of Eden thousands of years before? Yes. The Chinese were copied by the Japanese, which was just an extension of their empire. And so we find a duplicate of that stone erected in Japan today on Mount Koya. In 1837, the Sabbath came back to China in a movement called the Taiping Revolution. The Taipings, when asked why they observed the seventh day Sabbath, replied that it was first because the Bible taught it and second because their ancestors observed it as a day of worship. One of the disciples of Jesus, St. Thomas, brought the true Christian religion to India. And there the Christians were called through the centuries the St. Thomas Christians. For hundreds and hundreds of years until the 17th century, St. Thomas Christians continued to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. Widespread and enduring was the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath among the believers of the Church of the East and the St. Thomas Christians of India. While the St. Thomas Christians still have many beautiful churches in India, they have forgotten the Sabbath from the 17th century when the Roman Catholic Church set up instruments of torture at Goa. The Catholic priests forced the people to give up the Seventh-day Sabbath and keep the Sunday of Rome. Levi Matthew began the church in Egypt. This was called the Coptic Christian Church, and they kept the Sabbath for 400 years. The Ethiopian eunuch that Philip baptized went back to Ethiopia, and there he started a wonderful Christian church that has been keeping the Sabbath for 2,000 years. They actually say that Saturday is the greater Sabbath and Sunday's a lesser Sabbath. One of the places where Andrew and some of the other apostles went was north into an area called Armenia. It was a wonderful kingdom around the mountain of Ararat where the Ark of Noah had landed. These people had an ancient tradition of respecting the true religion. There were thousands and thousands of Jews in the cities of Armenia, and it was the first nation to officially accept the Sabbath-keeping Christianity of the apostles. These beautiful old churches, a thousand years old, give us some idea of the high culture of these Armenian Christians. And although, like other churches, they've forgotten much of the early apostolic Christianity, they still have services on Saturday afternoon, still honoring the Seventh-day Sabbath after 1900 years. In Russia, the Sabbath was kept by the early Christians as well. That church was called the Church of Muscovy. The Sabbath keepers were called the Sabodniki. They keep Saturday holy. They have solemn service on Saturdays. The Russian king Vladimir built a beautiful church called St. Sophia in the old capital of Russia called Kiev. Two missionaries, Cyril and Methodius, came from Asia Minor and brought these people an alphabet 
and their first book, which was the Bible. The churches of the East from earliest days had sanctified Saturday as the Sabbath. In the ninth century, Pope Nicholas wrote to the king of Bulgaria named Boris and told him, you must stop keeping the Sabbath. Bulgaria, in the early season of its evangelization, had been taught that no work should be performed on the Sabbath. There were many other Christians in Bulgaria that didn't belong to the state church. They had different names like Pasigini and Paulicians and Waldenses. The papal author Bonacursus wrote the following against the Pasigini. Not a few, he said, but many know what are the errors of those people who are called Pasigini. First, they teach that we should obey the Sabbath. Furthermore, to increase their error, they condemn and reject the church fathers and the whole Roman church. This is the city of Prague in Bohemia. Many of the Bohemians kept the seventh day Sabbath. There were many Waldenses in Bohemia and French Sabbath keeping Christians called Albigenses. These laid the foundation for the great Bohemian Reformation, which followed the teachings of John Huss, who was burned at the stake. The Bohemian Christians rose up against the Roman Church and many armies were sent out to fight them. But as long as they were truly faithful to God, they could not be conquered. In 1310, 200 years before Luther's thesis, the Bohemian Brethren constituted one-fourth of the population of Bohemia, and that they were in touch with the Waldenses who abounded in Austria, Lombardy, Bohemia, North Germany, Thuringia, Brandenburg, and Moravia. Erasmus pointed out how strictly Bohemian and Waldenses kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Who is Erasmus? Erasmus was one of the greatest historians and writers of his age. Erasmus testifies that even as late as about 1500, these Bohemians not only kept the seventh day scrupulously, but also were called Sabbatarians. There were still a few Sabbatarians left 300 years later. We read their history from 1635 to 1867 as thus described by Adolf Dux. The condition of the Sabbatarians was dreadful. Their books and writings had to be delivered to the Carisberg consistory to become the spoil of flames. How very sad. Yes. God's true people are always persecuted, but when they remain faithful, God can take care of them and use them. This is a statue of General Zitzka, who led the Sabbath-keeping Bohemian armies against the armies of Rome. Although he was blind, he never lost a battle. If we're faithful to God's law, he'll take care of us, too. Many hundreds of miles northeast of Bohemia, way up in the northern sea, are the beautiful British Isles. The air is moist, and there's so much rain there that everything's green all the time, and so they're called the Emerald Isles. In this beautiful and fertile country, God had established a church way back at the time of the apostles. Not too long ago, people in England had forgotten about that early Christian church of the Celtic people. But in old castles, monasteries, That's and libraries and in Europe and England, they began to find old manuscripts, and they found that these old Celtic Sabbath-keeping Christians had preserved civilization and education for the rest of the world when Europe became Catholic and barbaric and people couldn't even read or write. Couldn't read. Way out in Ireland, the people used to live in these old honeybee type of houses. A British boy, Patrick, was kidnapped by the Irish as a slave. After escaping, he came back as a missionary. In the fifth century, St. Patrick and his fellow monks conquered Irish paganism and established hundreds of schools and churches with thousands of students. Remains of these old monasteries are all over Ireland today. It seems to have been the custom in the Celtic churches of early times in Ireland as well as Scotland to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. Like Jesus did. They held that Saturday was properly the Sabbath on which they abstained from work. I sure love those old stone buildings. 
one of the graduates from one of Patrick's schools in Ireland was named Columba. He went to Scotland, and there he was a missionary to the pagan Picts. He started many schools there, and one of the best known was on a little island called Iona. It was a fertile island, and the students studied for 18 years to learn languages and how to grow gardens. Many of the kings of Europe are buried on the sacred soil of Iona today. This may be what Iona looked like at one time. Don't you think their little houses look kind of like igloos? Traders came from all over Europe to meet these monks. Columba, having continued his labors in Scotland 34 years, clearly and openly foretold his own death, and on Saturday, the 9th of June, said to his disciple Dermot, This day is called the Sabbath, that is the day of rest, and will it truly be to me, for it will put an end to my labors. He must have loved the Sabbath. The editor of the best biography of Columba says in a footnote, Our Saturday, the custom to call the Lord's Day Sabbath, did not commence until a thousand years later. From Iona was produced the most beautiful copy of the New Testament. It was called the Book of Kells, and it's the most beautiful book that's ever been made in the world. Shows what a high culture they were. This lonely tower is from the castle of the Welsh King Arthur, who was the defender and protector of the Celtic Sabbath-keeping church of the 6th century. It overlooks the old ruins of the monastery of Glastonbury, where Arthur's grave was discovered. The Sabbath-keeping monks were well-educated and very smart. In one of their books, a tract called the Book of Ballymote, scholars discovered that they used up to 70 different alphabets for different purposes. Wow! There's much evidence that the Sabbath prevailed in Wales universally until A.D. 1115 when the first Roman bishop was seated at St. David's. The old Welsh Sabbath-keeping churches did not even then altogether bow the knee to Rome, but fled to their hiding places in the mountains. The Sabbath was kept till the 13th century in Scotland and Ireland, and in the early 17th century, the Sabbath became a major issue among the Puritans of England. Here in England are about nine or ten churches that keep the Sabbath, besides many scattered disciples who have been eminently preserved. Many books and letters were written at that time to defend the true Sabbath of the early apostolic Christian church. One of the leading Sabbath keepers was the physician to the king and the queen. He was a well-educated man. His name was Dr. Peter Chamberlain, and on his grave, he had written his belief in the resurrection and in the Bible, that he had been a Christian for many, many years. And he also wrote on his grave which day of the week he kept as the Sabbath. A Christian keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus being baptized about the year 1648 and keeping the seventh day for the Sabbath above 32 years. See, God has had faithful Sabbath-keeping men through the years. One of those men was a man named Columbanus. He came to Europe in the 6th century from Patrick's School at Bangor, Ireland to be a missionary. He was invited to Europe to go into the forests and there build a beautiful school in Anagray, France. There are still graves there and remnants of that early Celtic school. They brought with them the classical education that had been lost and they established schools all through the snowy mountains and in the valleys of Europe. Europe had degenerated into a place where few people could even write their own name. These Celtic monks brought education. They laid the foundation for modern civilization in the Western world. How this beautiful, beautiful church is in the center in Switzerland called uh, St. Gallen. Look there, one of the there. Celtic monks, Gallus, established this college. There's a beautiful library there today, and among the books in the library are old Celtic manuscripts of the Old Latin or Itala Bible. That Bible was copied from the old manuscripts of Lucian. It's the same Bible as our King James Bible is today. Thousands of Celtic schools were established around the highways of Europe. It led to a great revival of knowledge, but the Roman church didn't like it. She chased the Celtic monks away and sent her Benedictine monks in to take over the schools. The Roman church likes to tell everybody that they were the ones that brought Christianity back to Europe, but it was really the Sabbath-keeping Christians. Let's just pretend that 
my little boy Joey is an Irish monk. Oh, and he's going to write something like the old Irish men had to write with quill pens on animal skins. We'll use paper instead. Let's see how easily he can do it. It wasn't easy to make those beautiful, colorful, illuminated manuscripts. It took many years of hard work, and those Bibles were very, very precious. They had different sizes of pens and whole rooms where the monks would write. Those monks studied for many years to learn the languages of the Bible, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Very good. Now, how would you like to copy a whole Bible like that? It would be very difficult, wouldn't it? After setting up schools in other parts of Europe, Columbanus, a Celtic teacher, came to Bobbio in northern Italy, and there he was given an area to build a beautiful school. That school and center is still to be seen today, although it's no longer Celtic. You see, they say that Columbanus had the ability to domesticate things like bears and other animals to use to plow the fields and clear the forests. In this way, he was able to build up schools right out of the forest with their bare hands. There, in the church in Bobbio, is to be found his grave. Columbanus was one of the greatest men that ever lived. He brought civilization and Christianity back to Europe. And like Columba of Scotland and Patrick of Ireland, I'll bet he kept the Sabbath day until the day that he died. By the end of the 13th century, the true Seventh-day Sabbath had almost been entirely forgotten in the Eastern churches because of the cruel Turkish Muslim armies under a ruler named Tamerlane. They destroyed Christian churches throughout all of Asia and the Middle East. In Europe, cruel Roman Catholic rulers destroyed God's faithful Sabbath-keeping people in Ireland and Scotland, all of Britain, and most all of Europe. This beautiful city is Albion, the capital of the Albigense Christians who kept the Sabbath in southern France. In one campaign, a million of them were destroyed together. How could they do that to those dear people? It was the practice generally of the Eastern churches and some churches of the West. For in the church of Milan, it seems the Saturday was held in a fair esteem. They came together on the Sabbath day to worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. 300 years after Jesus, St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, was a faithful Sabbath-keeping Christian. When he went south to Rome to visit his friend the bishop there, just to be polite, he'd go to church on Sunday. So he invented the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. His body can still be seen in the Basilica in Milano to this day. It's kind of creepy. In northern Italy, there were people that kept the Sabbath all the way down to the 15th and 16th century. These people were called the people of the valleys, the Vaudois, or the Waldenses. They can trace their history way back to the 4th century when they fled from the persecution of the Roman Christians. You can still see their little towns high in those mountains. Because they observed no other day of rest but the Sabbath days, they called them in Sabbathus as much as to say, as they observed no Sabbath. Because they wouldn't go to church on Sunday. Let's just imagine that these Sabbath-keeping Christians are fleeing with, from the Roman soldiers. They're taking their children and their carts and their horses, and they're fleeing together high into the mountains to a valley called the Pra, where there are some villages where they'll be taken care of. And then as the soldiers come, they have to flee. Maybe they'll go into a cave there to worship God on the Sabbath day. What would it be like to go into a cave on the Sabbath and know that the Roman soldiers are coming and that they may persecute you? This is a picture of a cave that I found in the museum in one of the Waldensian valleys. The pastors were called Uncle or Barba. They were educated men, and they would teach the children. The children memorized their Bible so that they would never, ever forget it. They were well-educated children, too. They studied for many, many long years. They even went to some of the great universities in Europe. Now, let's say the Roman soldiers come in and they grab the pastor. They say, you can't teach these things anymore, and they take him out and they put him to death or torture him. They grab the Bible and they tear the pages out of him. This Bible is no good. You can't read these books. 
And what will they do with the women? As they grab the women, they take the women out away from their families. Oh, and many no. families will never see those mamas again. The babies never see the mamas Poor again. They're babies. taken away and taken off to a Catholic monastery or school where they're educated in the religion that their parents taught them to hate. If I was taken, I'd stay close to Jesus. Although they were persecuted for hundreds of years, they continued to educate missionaries. Their school was in the almost inaccessible solitude of a deep mountain gorge called Prado Tó and their studies were severe and long continued. Many became pastor physicians doing medical missionary work. Often they posed as salesmen and among the things they sold were little copies of the Bible that they read to the people. And so more and more churches were established throughout the valleys of Europe. Many times these pastors died. Many times the towns and the cities were destroyed and the people wandered in the mountains. It was cold in those mountains. They were hungry in those mountains. And yet even though they suffered and even though they were sick, they counted it an honor to suffer for Jesus because Jesus has done so much and he suffered for us. Although those dear Sabbath keeping Walden Seas had to suffer, they'll be in heaven, won't they? Yes. Many years later, after being chased out of their valleys, they came back, led by this pastor, Enrico Arnaud. And today, their churches can be seen in the valleys. But in the 16th century, they lost the Sabbath. How could they forget Jesus' day? It was largely forgotten in Europe because of a thousand years of Catholic persecutions. In the East, their churches became formal and faithless, forgetting the Sabbath. Most were absorbed into Islam and Buddhism, but when the great Protestant reformers arose in Europe 400 years ago, the historians tell us that there were still some Sabbath keepers left, a faithful remnant of the true church of the earliest times. Some have suffered torture because they would not rest when others kept Sunday, for they declared it to be the holiday and law of Antichrist. In 1664, a man named Stephen Mumford came to the United States from London, and he was a Sabbath-keeping Christian. About 10 years later, in 1671, the Seventh-day Baptist Church began. In 741, a Count Zinzendorf from Moravia came over to the United States with his group and started worshiping with a German group of Sabbath keepers in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. In 1833, a Baptist minister by the name of William Miller began to preach that Jesus was coming soon. He was soon joined by other ministers in America and around the world. It was called the Great Advent Movement. A dear Seventh-day Baptist lady named Rachel Oakes, a lady from Washington, New Hampshire, brought the Sabbath to the attention of an Adventist minister named Elder Frederick Wheeler. From that date on, more and more Adventists accepted the Seventh-day Sabbath. An old Adventist sea captain, Joseph Bates, went to New Hampshire and studied with Pastor Wheeler and became convinced. Bates wrote an article in 1846 called The Seventh-day Sabbath, A Perpetual Sign. Then Ellen White, an Adventist lady, had a vision in 1847. God showed her a beautiful place in heaven called the sanctuary. There she saw the Ten Commandments and the Seventh-day Sabbath commandment had a halo around it. The Adventists learned that the vision in Revelation 12 is a picture story of Jesus' bride, the only true church. How Jesus has protected her through history from being destroyed by wicked kings and false teachings and that now at the end of time only those keeping all God's commandments and the Seventh-day Sabbath are truly the last remnant of the church of the apostles. Jesus, our high priest, wants to save everybody and take them home with him to heaven. But he can only save those who let him give them a clean, pure heart. If we will ask him to forgive our sins and come into our hearts, he will seal his Ten Commandments there with the Seventh-day Sabbath as a sign that we are truly part of his special remnant church. You see, it was part of Jesus' wonderful plan to save the people of all nations that his church Israel would teach everybody to worship him, the Creator, keep his holy law, and honor his special sign, the Seventh-day Sabbath. Isaiah 56, 6 and 7 says, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, 
Every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. Jesus tells us through the old prophet Ezekiel about the wonderful covenant or agreement that he will make with his true people. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statues, and ye shall keep my judgment and do them. What Ezekiel says here is simply this. First, Jesus gives us a clean heart. Heart. Then, He puts His Holy Spirit inside us. Inside? And that Holy Spirit causes us to obey all God's commandments. Then we're holy and clean and pure, and we're safe to bring to heaven to live with God and the angels. Wonderful! The special work of Christians today is to go to the people of the world and remind them that their own ancestors, which kept the seventh day holy, gave them their culture. Their own ancestors, in following God's sacred law, had laid the foundation of their own civilization. That they must be the repairs of the breach, or restore. Remember the forgotten Sabbath commandment. We need to give back to the people the forgotten paths of their own Christian ancestors. Then Jesus can finally come to take them home. In Isaiah 58, verse 12, 13, and 14, we read about the last generations of true Christians. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasures, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. When Jesus comes, he'll raise his faithful people from their musty graves, and with them will fly through the starry heavens to the glorious city. There we'll meet Noah and Moses and the disciples of Jesus and the Syrian missionaries of China and India, the Celtic monks and the Waldenses. Jesus will make us a whole new earth, and every Sabbath all people will come and worship before him. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, please forgive my sins. And Jesus, Put your clean heart inside me. Seal your law inside me with your holy Sabbath day. And Jesus, please come soon and take us home. In Jesus' name, amen.